I had the opportunity recently to meet a fellow YouTuber in person, David Parsley, and his channel, David Parsley's Scale Model Emergency Vehicles, is one you definitely want to check out and subscribe to. And while we were talking about career paths and different things we've done over the years, I got to thinking about the trucks I've driven, and when I got home, I dug through the archives, and here's a look at them. Number 119 is a late 1970s Mac R, and it was the first truck that JNF Trucking assigned me to when I went to work for them back in late 1993. This picture was taken heading south along US 11, near Kingsley, Pennsylvania, with the Martins Creek Railroad Viaduct visible in the background. Basic Mac R interior from the late 70s. This truck had the six-speed transmission with five gears on the main box and a high-low reverse on the auxiliary box. I put the chrome T-handles on there just to dress things up a little bit. Getting into December, time to put a wreath on the front for decoration. Typical load for us heading into the U.S. was steel of different sizes and configurations. This one's a load of steel tube. 119 was getting to be an old truck at the time in late 1993, but this single axle B model shunt truck at one of the warehouses I was delivering to was even older. We did a lot of miles in Pennsylvania, and this is a shot coming through the Lehigh Tunnel. You can see by the scoop on the hood that number 119 had a 315 tip turbine engine. Almost all of JNF's fleet at the time was made up of our model conventionals. There was a couple of F-model cab overs in the fleet, and I spent about a week in one. Here's a picture taken along the side of 401 Highway in Canada, heading back from a pickup in Chicago. A common backhaul for us into Canada was crushed cars out of northern New York. We'd bring these up Interstate 81, across the Thousand Islands, and take 401 westbound back towards Ajax, Ontario, where JNF was based out of. As a driver at the time in late 1993, I hated hauling these things. Many years later, though, that picture did inspire a scale model version of 119, along with a crushed car load. I have this model displayed in the office at my current job, as a reminder of my few years hauling freight out in the highway. After a few months of number 119, I moved into 111, which had identical specs, 315 tip turbine engine, 6-speed transmission, same long wheelbase, and same 36-inch coffin sleeper. This truck did have newer paint and the newer lettering scheme that JNF had switched to. Empty containers were back all that we as drivers like to get because they are easy to chain down, no tarps required, and no customs paperwork at the border when returning to Canada. Almost as good as a backhaul was green lumber, because this didn't require tarping. Many loads of green hardwood came out of mills in Ohio, Pennsylvania, and New York, going to a hardwood flooring company in Toronto, who did their own kiln drying for control of the process. The long wheelbase on trucks like 119 and 111 wasn't a case of style or ride comfort. It was a result of these trucks originally being straight trucks that pulled pup trailers like the one pictured here. JNF got their start delivering prefabricated home kits made by Viceroy Homes in Port Hope, Ontario using straight truck and pup trailer combinations like this. As the business model changed and JNF expanded, these trucks became tractors by the expedient of removing the flatbed, bolting a fifth wheel on, and sticking a bunk behind the cab. This resulted in the long wheelbase appearance visible here, which had nothing to do with Western Bridge formulas. In fact, JNF's typical operating radius was 500 miles from Toronto, which meant we rarely got west of the Mississippi or south of the Mason-Dixon line. 111 was another one of the trucks that I did replicate in scale model form. This one I built in 132nd scale using the monogram snap kit. The next truck I had was number 166, shorter wheelbase, aluminum buds on the front wheels, aluminum tanks. This one had a 350 Mach engine with a 15 speed. This was about a 1986, and the rear suspension was actually Hendrickson. I believe this thing used to be a formal gravel hauler before JNF bought it. It had been repainted blue when JNF bought it and overhauled it. JNF at the time would tend to buy a lot of older trucks, fix them up, and put them to work in their fleet. 
This little lumber is kiln dried, which required tarping. This little stuffed frog would wedge into place between the no draft window and the mirror bracket and would ride there on the highway. Even at 60 miles an hour he was secure and I still have him. During the mid 90s, GNF was buying up a lot of former owner operator trucks that were reaching the 6 to 7 year old mark and putting them to work. Depending on how much overhaul the truck required, it might go to work in the original colors, as was the case with this black one here with a 60 inch flat top bunk, 350 Mac again, and a 13 speed, which was the next truck I moved into after 166. This truck, number 169, could carry 400 gallons of fuel, with 150 on either side under the cab, and an additional pair of 50 gallon tanks behind those. This was one of three loads I brought back during the summer of 1996, from Norfolk Naval Terminal in Virginia, up to Tilsonburg, Ontario. These were CNC milling machines in crates. They weren't overly heavy, but they were bulky and required a double drop trailer to stay within height restrictions. And this is number 181, which is a 1989 Superliner, and the last truck I drove before I left JNF and in fact left over the road trucking altogether. This is another great example of an owner operator truck that JNF bought and put to work after re-lettering. Number 181 had the usual 350 Mac engine, 15 speed transmission, 60 inch high rise bunk, and effectively dual everything including the air cleaners. This load is playground equipment going from Ontario into a school somewhere in the New England area, and the trailer with the 10 foot spread is one I like to pull because of the flexibility in loading. If I was ever in doubt, could always load a little bit heavier on the rear of the trailer because I was allowed 40,000 on the tandems as long as I wasn't over 80,000 on the whole combination. Loading an empty container for return to Canada. Dispatch wasn't fond of these loads because they didn't pay very well, but they were a quick way to get the truck back into Canada for paying load back south. One drawback of the 10 foot trailer spread is tire scrub on sharp corners which is really evident here when trying to back down the driveway and around the back corner of the small tool and die shop. And the fun doesn't stop there because I still have to get at least the back part of the wagon into the loading bay door. This is clearly a facility that was not laid out for tractor trailers. Thankfully it was only a fairly small die which could be loaded near the back of the trailer and it was going down to Kokomo, Indiana to the Chrysler casting plant. This is also one of my JNF trucks which I replicated in miniature, this time in 124 scale using Italeri's American Superliner as a starting point. After I left over the road trucking, I went back into the welding and construction industry, and I was still driving 89 as it turned out, only this time it was an F800 with a small 4 ton Pittman boom on it. And this was a handy little truck for making deliveries because the boom gave you the ability to self unload. In fact, one of my main reasons for leaving over the road trucking was the unpaid waiting time incurred during loading and unloading operations. The worst offenders for this waiting time were typically steel mills and warehouses. And I think the longest time I got stuck waiting around was Algoma Steel, where it took them about 12 hours to put one coil on the trailer. Here we've got a small load of beams and columns loaded up for delivery on a nice Canadian winter day. And here, with the snow moving in, a prefabricated set of stairs and landing. We also fabricated front and rear racks for the flatbed, so in the event a longer piece had to be carried, it could extend out over the cab and minimize the rear overhang. And we do get some warm days up here in Canada. Something I've always liked about flatbed hauling is the thinking required to figure out how to best secure different types of cargo. In this case it's fairly straightforward. We have rolled channels one layer deep. Structural steel fabrications are more challenging because each piece is designed for a specific application and generally not all pieces on the load are going to be the same size. In this example, the two beams in the middle of the trailer are best shipped standing up because of the wide plates on the bottom flange. 
blocking is placed between all parts of the load to keep things from moving, and also to allow access for chokers when unloading with a crane at the final destination. As the load is built up in height, the different tiers get their own straps to keep everything stable, and because steel has sharp corners, any time a strap runs over the edge of a beam, a piece of pipe has been cut down to act as edge protection. With wood crossers in place, another layer of beams is set on top, and all these pictures are of the same load to show the process as it progresses. With the next layer of beams and columns in place, a strap is added to keep it secure, and another row of crossers is put in, and each place where the crosser might be spending too long a distance is built up with wood blocking. With the last row of items placed on top and centered on the trailer, chains are put over the whole works to secure the completed load. Here's how it looks from ground level, with a combination of chains and straps ensuring that every part of the load is tied down. This completed load came out to around 40,000 pounds total, and the weight could be estimated fairly accurately by knowing the weight per foot of the different cross sections of beam and tube being carried. And here's what's pulling it, a 2002 Mac Vision, which the welding company purchased second hand in the fall of 2010. It's interesting to compare with that 89 Superliner, being also white in color, and with a 60 inch high rise bunk. Here's that same load on its way to the job site, pictured along a highway in northern Ontario. This was one of about 10 loads of structural steel that went up to a school about 10 hours away from our shop. The scenery in northern Ontario features a lot of pine trees, and in the late fall of the year, it also features a lot of snow. Being a private carrier, we're making the return trip empty, which can be challenging with an empty flatbed trailer on snowy icy roads. Winter in Ontario is also great fun when it's necessary to break off all that snow sculpture to use the tie-down straps or crank the landing gear down to unhook the trailer. The last truck I drove at the welding company before I left the industry and made another career change was this 89 International S2600 with an L10 Cummins, 8-speed transmission and a 9-ton Pittman crane. Very similar configuration to the F800 just in the larger package. This is the same job site in Northern Ontario that we delivered the 10 loads of structural steel to. Here we're using the truck to move some bundles of open web steel joists around to a different part on the job site. One advantage of the larger crane over the small one on the F800 was a greater reach, which made it feasible to do some installation work on our own. And we'll close out with a view from the control station here lifting a prefabricated set of stairs into place. If you've made it this far, thanks for watching all the way to the end. Although I don't drive trucks anymore, other than the occasional fire truck, my interest in them is as strong as it always was, and I'll close with this statement that I had lettered on the back of our 2002 Mac because it's as true as it always was. If you've got it, a truck brought it.